Lord Jesus, you said everyone who would hear these words of yours and does them is compared to a wise man who built his house on a rock. When the rains descend, the rivers come, the winds blow and fall against the house, it does not fall, founded on the rock. Everyone who hears your words and does not do them is foolish as a man who builds his house on sand. When the rains descend, the floods come, the winds blow, slam against the house, and the house falls. Great is its fall. You teach as one having authority, not as mere men, because you are the authority. You are the very Word of God. And so we hang on every one of your words. We need them. We come now to hear from you. We come now to hear your words. You gave these last words to your beloved disciple, the Apostle John, the Revelator, so that we might know how the world ends, so that we might know how to live in it now. Help us by the power of your Holy Spirit to gain from your word as you intend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 9. And if you had assumed since we finished chapter 9 last week, I would have said chapter 10. Sorry to disappoint. When you're on a road trip sometimes and you're driving at freeway speeds past those little brown signs, you know, little brown signs that mark some point of interest, like world's largest pet rock, world's largest ball of twine, or some other such thing, and you're tempted to pull over. We need to slow down. We need to, we need to see this, whatever it is. One of those brown signs for us in our exposition of the book of Revelation is at the end of chapter 9. And we're going to slow down this morning and just take a closer look, particularly at the issue of idolatry as it is seen at the end of Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9, of course, gives us two scenes, the fifth trumpet judgment, the sixth trumpet judgment against God and the end times during the great tribulation, during the day of the Lord, where demonic hordes will be unleashed to torment and then to kill humans on the earth. A terrifying time. What is arresting about the end of Revelation chapter 9 is the response of the earth dwellers. That's a technical term in the book of Revelation for those who are alive during that time, who survive judgment after judgment after judgment, but do not repent They do not look to God in faith. They are aware that God is the one pouring out His wrath and still they have their fist in God's face and they will not yield. It is a stark depiction of the human heart. And we begin to ask the question, what will it take to soften the heart? Will the neck be stiffened so that it is snapped? This is stunning. We're coming back this morning to verses 20 and 21. Because we need to see behind the rebellious refusal to repent is a heart commitment to something that the humans then value more than God. They love some things more than they love God. This is the fundamental definition of idolatry. Look down at Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries, nor of their sexual immorality, nor of their thefts. As we said last week, these people have a white-knuckle grip, and they've said, you can have my sin when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers, rather than turn and have life 
and freedom and light and joy and eternity in the presence of the glory of God. What we want to do this morning is examine the war that is in the human heart and is on display here. It is a battle of worship. The human heart was designed by God to adore, to think of something big and to dwell on it, to be enamored by it, to love it. And of course, that design was bound up in man's fundamental reason for being, to delight in the glory of God, to rejoice in all that God is. For the human heart to set itself on lower horizons is to rob itself of the joy for which it was designed. Which is why idolatry is a libel against God's character and all of His infinite goodness to think that there's something better than Him. And it is an eternal ruin of the soul which was made for the enjoyment of God. So idolatry is this two-pronged evil against God and against man, perpetrated by man and fueled by Satan. Here's what you need to know this morning about this war. Here's what you need to know this morning about idolatry. We'll, we'll just sort of give five points. These, these come from details at the end of Revelation chapter 9, although they're not strictly following the grammar of the end of chapter 9. I want to summarize what we find in these two verses about idolatry and connect it to perhaps a bibber, bib, bigger biblical picture of idolatry. The first thing you need to know about idolatry is that an idol is nothing. An idol, uh, some sort of physical fabrication of a deity, is in reality a nothing, a big fat nothing. There is only one God. And we grant that Satan is called the God of this world, and, and we talk about other gods like Baal and Ashtoreth and Allah, but they are no gods at all. And, and so an idol that represents these things is called in verse 20, the work of men's hands. Do you catch the great tragic irony of this? Mankind's made in the image of God. God spoke everything into existence out of nothing, and then his creatures go about and fabricate out of what God has made something of their own handiwork. And then they bow down to it. This is several levels of insanity. Notice the end of verse 20, they are idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood. The indictment from Romans chapter 1 that Paul gives there is that the humans in rebellion against God worshiped and served the created thing rather than the creator who is to be forever praised. This is a fundamental problem, obviously an insult to the creator of the universe, but an insanity to worship something that you built. You see, when somebody makes something or creates something, he is owner or lord of it by right of creation. By right of creation, we are owned by God, and, and in His grace and kindness, He sustains our existence and gives us good gifts even when we're ungrateful, even when we don't notice, even when we give something else or somebody else credit for it. God is the giver of all good things. And here, what does man do with things God has given, which are supposed to exist for the service and enjoyment of God, now fabricated and recreated into something a man calls a God? It is a double insult. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Here, the prophet Isaiah describes the insanity of idolatry. Look at verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with Him? 
This is a rhetorical question. The obvious answer is no one compares to God. No likeness that we could fashion gets anywhere close to who he is. This is why God was so offended when the Israelites coming out of Egypt made those brass bulls and said, this is Yahweh who brought you out of Egypt. As if you could contain and define and describe the infinite God of the universe with some animalian statue. It's offensive. Look at verse 19. As for graven images, a craftsman casts it. A goldsmith plates it with gold and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. He who is too impoverished to make such a contribution chooses a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a wise craftsman to prepare a graven image that will not totter, it will not be shaken. What is it? it it's a mantelpiece that has to sit somewhere in the house and, and be supported. And if, if the ground shook, the idol would fall. Look at Isaiah 44, beginning in verse 9. I alluded to this last week. It's, it's worth reading this section. It, it's one thing as we look into this section to read it and laugh at the participants of idolatry here. But we dare not get too far in our mocking. Verse 9, those who form a graven image are all of them futile. Their desirable things are of no profit. Even their own witness fail to see or to know so that they will be put to shame. Who has formed a god or cast a graven image to no profit? Behold, all his companions will be put to shame. The craftsmen themselves are mere men. Let them all assemble themselves. Let them stand up. Let them be in dread. Let them together be put to shame. The man crafts iron into a cutting tool and does his work over the coals, forming it with hammers and working it with his powerful arm. He also gets hungry and he has no power. He drinks no water and he becomes weary. Another crafts wood. He extends a measuring line. He outlines it with a stylus. He makes it with planes and outlines it with a compass and makes it like the form of a man, like the glory of man, so that it may sit in a house. <laughs> the great irony. You're building a God. What's it going to do? Sit in the house. In order to cut cedars for himself, he takes a cypress or an oak and raises it for himself among the trees of the forest. He plants a fir and the rain makes it grow. Then it becomes something for a man to burn. So he takes one of them and warms himself. He also kindles a fire to bake bread. He also works to produce a god and worships it. He makes it a graven image and falls down before it. Half of it he burns in the fire. Over this half he eats meat as he roasts a roast and is satisfied. He also warms himself and says, Aha, I'm warm, I've seen the fire. But the rest of it he makes into a god, his graven image. He falls down before it and he worships. He also prays to it and says, Deliver me for you are my god. They do not know. Nor do they understand. For God has smeared over their eyes so that they cannot see and over their hearts so that they will have no insight. And no one causes this to return to his heart. Nor is there knowledge or understanding to say, I burned half of it in the fire, I bake bread over its coals, I roast meat and I eat it, then I make the rest into an abomination. I fall down before a block of wood. He feeds on ashes. A deceived heart turns him aside. And he cannot deliver his soul. And he cannot say, is there not a lie in my right hand? Do you see the insanity? Over and over again, the Old Testament describes the idols, the works of men's hands, as those things that cannot see, cannot hear, cannot smell, cannot walk. I want you to turn to the New Testament and look for a moment at 1 Corinthians chapter 8. This is a section of our Bibles we need to get to someday. 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 is a monumental section about idolatry. 
And to set the stage for a moment, you remember in the first century, the religion of the day, outside of Judaism and this uh, outgrowth of Judaism called Christianity, was the pantheon of the Greeks and the Romans. And they worshipped all the various gods and demigods who were to provide for them various things. Crops, prosperity, um, posterity. And they looked to this pantheon of gods for wisdom. Uh, They were terrible moral examples, but they followed them anyway. And they looked to them for goodies and treats in life. And These gods were sacrificed to. There were pagan altars throughout all of the cities of the Roman Empire, all the cities of the Greek Empire before it. And these altars were dedicated to the various gods. And and no one of those gods was laying claim to being supreme over the whole universe. They were sort of regional deities and and favorites among the various localities. And and they didn't seem to be jealous of one another. You could go to one temple and give a sacrifice to one god and another temple and a sacrifice to another god. In fact, you had the god of war and the god of crops and the god of fertility. And, And in order to get everything you wanted in life, you paid the dues to all the various members of the pantheon. You gave your sacrifices at all the altars. You sort of try to cover all of your bases. By the way, it's not too far removed from the prevalent notion today of spiritual people who believe there's truth in all the religions and sort of try to tip their hat to a little bit of everything. That was the Greco-Roman world. And 1 Corinthians 8 to 10 are three chapters devoted to how do Christians who have been rescued out of that idolatry now live in a world filled with it. Because you would go to Fry's and Costco and you would buy your ribeye steak. And maybe you were aware that that steak was a couple days before sacrificed in a temple ceremony to a pagan deity. And you might be confronted with a crisis of conscience. Whoa, that meat is sacrificed to idols. What what should I do about that? I, I can't eat it. I don't believe in idolatry. And helpfully here in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10, Paul helps us think through all the little permutations of how to live in that world. One of the things he identifies is in 1 Corinthians 8, 4. Listen to these words. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing. In the world. There's only one God. So there's a freedom, Christian, in the first century to go to Fry's and buy a ribeye steak. If it was sacrificed to an idol beforehand, an idol's nothing. It's still just steak. You can eat it. And if you read these three chapters carefully, you discover there are other considerations too. For those who had just come out of idolatry, the the sting and the remembrance of a life lived in futility, worshiping other gods, created a problem. And new believers regularly had the difficulty of their conscience being burdened, not having all the knowledge that, okay, idols are nothing, still haunted by the memories of having worshipped those idols and participated in eating ribeye to the glory of Zeus. Now I'm going to stay away from ribeye. I'm not going to eat meat. And what is the instruction to Christians here? Don't ruin your brother. Don't run over his conscience. It's better to not eat meat than to put him in a position where he's tempted to sin against his conscience by eating meat because the slide is greased by your freedom. Be careful. Your brother's soul matters. and Broccoli's okay. So what do we do? We, we inform our consciences. Idols are nothing. Paul will go on later to say, but don't you dare eat that ribeye in a temple. And if you want the theme for the whole section, it's found in 1014. Listen carefully to this. Therefore, my beloved, 
Paul's speaking to the Corinthians, whom he loved rather selflessly. Flee idolatry. Run away from it. Now in that context, you're thinking meat, temples, idols, it's all so visible and tangible. Great. Um, I'll have fish and I'll get it out of the lake myself. But idolatry runs deeper than meat and temples. And I want this command to stick with us for a moment as we work through idolatry this morning. Flee it. Flee it. That's the command. That's the central point of that whole section. What we learn at first is that an idol is nothing. But secondly, what we need to recognize is that an idol is something. I just told you it was nothing. Now I'm going to tell you it's something. Idolatry represents something. And, and we might even say idolatry represents some things. What does idolatry represent? A variety of different things are behind the idol. First and foremost, we might just imagine the worship of a manageable God. The worship of a manageable God. This is religion in all of its forms. We, we, we want by human fallen nature, something we can get our eyes on, something we can get our hands around, something we can touch, something we can see, some, something that has some physical presence that we can all look around and say, see, these bronze bulls are Yahweh who brought us out of Egypt. We want something smaller than the infinite God who holds the entire span of the universe in His palm. And listen, this isn't just about physical realities. This is about the way we think. Philosophers love to imagine a deity, if they believe in one, smaller than their own puny brains. They want something they can get around. They want something they can confine and control. All of this religious form stuff, it's the reason that, that most of the religions of the world work towards something physical. Icons and statues and altars, things that people can taste and touch. Remember the commendation that Jesus gave to doubting Thomas? Blessed are you who believe, great, but blessed are those who believe and have never seen. And faith is shortcutted by something we can touch. And our sinful hearts want like a physical proof for something. And we'll settle for less than the one true God just because we can touch something. Or we'll settle for less than the one true God just because we can comprehend something. And listen, a God smaller than your thought processes is not worth worshiping. No offense to your puny brain. Maybe some offense. All of this shorts the transcendence of God. That he is above and beyond and bigger and infinite. To paraphrase Steve Lawson, God made man in his own image, and ever since, man has been at the business of returning the favor. Let's make a God in our own image. And, and that is the way that man conceives of God when man rejects the one true God. We project onto deity human features, human tendencies. Which means when we think about something like anger in God, we don't think about the holy, good, beautiful, excellent anger of the righteous God of the Bible. We think of some sort of out of control, sinful thing that humans do. When we think about love, we don't think about the transcendent, holy love of the God of the universe. We want whatever it is to be more like ours. We remake God in our own image. The natural tendency of mankind is to project a view of God in human likeness in order to make Him manageable, comprehensible. It's a misconception of God. Idolatry can not only represent a wrong view of the true God, but can also represent the worship of demons. This is in our text, Revelation 9.20. They did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons. Do you catch the import of those statements back to back? 
So a man walks into the idol craftsman's factory and says, hey, uh, give me one of those uh, Molech statues. I want that. And it's just a piece of bronze. It, it, it was mined out of the ground and refined into some metal that could be shaped and molded and made into the shape and then sold for $1.99 at the factory. Yeah, I want one of those. But what's behind that physical thing? In many cases, actual demons. Those demonic forces we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, the, the, the ones governed by the prince of the power of the air, the, the authorities and principalities and powers... Listen, a lot of the worship of the world, a lot of the pagan idolatries, the worshipers in those systems actually encounter dark supernatural powers. There are demons behind them. If you go to India, for instance, and you walk into the temples, and, and I have friends who have, who have been in and around the temple of Kali, uh, there is demonic, dark wickedness there. And the people actually know they're worshiping a demon, a personal, supernatural being who is malevolent. I have a missionary friend in China who has worked for years with a, a tribal people, uh, sort of rejected by the, the Chinese, um, and, and they worship pagan deities. They're not Buddhists, they're not communists. They are pagan demon worshipers, and they know they are worshiping a demon. They said to my missionary friend, oh, we, we love your Jesus. We hear you talk about him, and he sounds so wonderful, but our God is this, because we are this people. I wish we could follow your God. You can, he says. They know they're worshiping demons. They've seen the power. They know the darkness. They have felt the malevolence. Listen, idolatry doesn't need personal demonic forces in order to exist. John Calvin said the human heart is a veritable factory of idols. That assembly line can manufacture things to worship as fast as it can think. However, Satan is the father of lies, the lord of darkness, the deceiver blinding the minds of the unbelieving world, and demons and demonic activity behind religions are active in his plan to deceive. And so they are active in ideologies and religions and worldviews. Idolatry can represent the misconstruing of the one true God. Idolatry can represent the actual worship of demons, but ultimately, idolatry boils down to the worship of self, to the worship of self. And you have to understand the art of the deal of idolatry. The human serves the idol to get what the human wants from the idol. It's the agreement made with the genie and the lamp. Rub the lamp three ways, it lets the genie out, genie gets some fresh air, the human gets the three wishes. When our deal is done, we go our separate ways, I got what I want, you got what you want. You serve the idol long enough to get what you want out of it. Not love for the idol, not love for the pagan demonic personality behind the religion, not in love with the misconstrual of the one true God, but frankly, in love with self. What do I want? I will be king. From me, through me, and to me be all the glory forevermore. At my right hand are pleasures forever. That is the baseline bottom of idolatry. It is me getting what I want. That is what idolatry represents. Third thing you need to know about idolatry is that it walks hand in hand with vice. Idolatry walks hand in hand with vice. We see this in our text, Revelation 9 verse 21. The text says, And they did not repent of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their sexual immoralities, nor their thefts. 
We read in verse 20, they did not repent of the works of their hands, and in parallel statement, they did not repent of their vices. And this may seem at first like two unrelated offenses, but I want to take some time this morning to observe their connectedness. You see, idolatry truly happens in the heart long before a worshiper bows down in front of some pagan altar. When the human heart reconceives God to fit his own desires, he makes a God after his own liking. The prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 14 gives us an interesting phrase. He indicts the people of Israel, you have set up idols in your hearts. You you put up the stumbling blocks for your sin inside of you. And, And that is the reality. Idolatry begins in the heart. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 3 to see explicitly this connection between idolatry and vice. Look at verse 5. We'll come back to these instructions later this morning. But for now, just notice there is a list of vices here. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Notice nowhere in the list is there a Baal or a Molech or an Ashtoreth mentioned. There's no pagan altar here. There are no sacrifices. These are sort of abstract. And greed here is equaled to idolatry. Greed is a heart disposition. Wait, wait, I I didn't I didn't go down to the, the temple of Aphrodite and consort with the workers. I just kind of wanted my neighbor's stuff. God calls it idolatry. Why is it idolatry? The reality is the greedy one is an idolater, having never stepped into a pagan temple, never offered a sacrifice to Baal, never danced around the maypole, never prayed to the dead. But when he wanted something that didn't belong to him, God calls it idolatry. Because it is operative in the heart when there is no statue or totem or talisman or altar. Now, the reason that idolatry walks hand in hand with vice is because at the heart level, whenever we sin, we are choosing to love something more than we love God. That gets us back to the basic, fundamental, biblical definition of idolatry. God not in first place, something else in first place. I'll try to get from God what I really want. I'll play church. I'll I'll do some ceremonial religious things. I'll read my Bible so that my day will go better. Any of those sort of like exchanges where we treat God like a genie in a lamp boils down to this definition of idolatry. I want what I want. What do I have to say to God to get it? Sin is a rejection of God as first love. And it is a failure to believe what God says. Disobedience to God has at its root idolatrous unbelief. Look at the vice list in Revelation 9.21. Sorceries, sexual immoralities, murders, thefts. We looked at these last week, and in our own day, these are becoming increasingly normalized. You read about them every day, and it seems like all of these things are on the rise. And in the end times, they will be ubiquitous, prolific. It will actually provoke the end times judgment of God. The world is not going to get better. It's going to get worse until the end. Think about murder for a moment. Murder is internal hatred acted out. It is a rejection of the two greatest commands. 
love God, love others. How is it a failure to love God to murder another human? Well, you're, you're rejecting God's prohibition. If you loved God, you would just do what He says. To do other than He says is a rejection of God and a lack of love for God. You have removed God from His throne as first place in the universe and put Him secondary to what you want. And not only that, but you're willing to end the life of an image bearer to get what you want. It is a supreme violation of the two greatest commands. I'm willing to disregard God's rightful rule over my life, and I'm willing to end another's life to get what I want. It is the worship of self at bottom. It is the following the example of Satan, who was the murderer from the beginning, the murderer of the human race. And in the face of God's end times judgment against murder, the earth dwellers in Revelation 9 will not repent of their murders. And I just want you to think about this. There is a trend now in the day of ultrasounds. Do you understand the day of the ultrasound? Ultrasound changed things in our view of the sanctity of life. There is no debate anymore that what is growing in a womb is human and it is called a baby. And now the trend is moving towards celebrate your abortion. Boast in it. Remove the stigma by just saying, it's good, it's good, it's good, I promise. The normalizing of murder of the most vulnerable among us can only have the dire consequences of normalizing the stamping out of image bearers across the board. And it's, abortion's not bad just because of a slippery slope. It is just inherently wicked. And yet it is a daily occurrence in civilized society. Listen, when you're committed to an idol and you think the idol can give you what you want, you will go to great lengths and do anything the idol says to do. In the worship of self, men will do what they can get away with to serve their idols. The second in the list is sorceries. We talked about this last week. The Greek word is pharmakon, uh, or pharmacology, uh, pharmaceuticals comes from that word. In this word, in the Bible, is the overlap of drugs and spiritual darkness. And so whether, whether people are into altered states of consciousness for ecstasy or for information, still falls under this category called sorceries. People can get into drugs for mind-altering, pleasure-seeking, escape from reality, or intentional interaction with demonic forces. All of this is an idolatry, whether through the active seeking of other gods or violating the prohibitions of the one true God. God said, don't talk to the dead. Don't seek guidance from fortune tellers. Don't enlist dark supernatural power. And while sorcery seeks to actively involve the forces of darkness, it still in the end boils down to the worship of self. I want what I can get out of demons or drugs. We should not be surprised that Satan entices humans to worship themselves. This was, after all, the first temptation. Just eat. You'll be like God. That was the temptation Satan put before humanity. And Satan's not like God in terms of demanding soul worship, worship only of himself. God's jealous for our attention. Satan's not jealous at all in this way. He he can be satisfied if you worship any God, any being, any likeness, any created thing, any pleasure rather than God. He does not demand soul fealty to the house of Satan. He's happy if you worship relationships, money, power, Molech, any demon under any name. He's happy if you 
worship the name of the one true God and misconstrue Him. He's not jealous that way. It's all idolatry. The next one in the list in verse 21 is immoralities. Again, we talked about this last week. The word is porneia. Sexual immorality is in view in all of its iterations. How is this idolatry? It is the love of pleasure rather than love of God. And listen, God invented sexuality for all of its biblical purposes. He intended it to be good and sin perverts it. To be a lover of pleasure that comes from immoral grasping in sexuality is to commit the idolatry of loving the created thing more than the creator. It is to commit the idolatry of a lack of love for God by going outside of His bounds and His prohibitions, which are designed for our joy and making our own way out of love of self. The last one on the list is thefts. How is theft? Idolatry. At bottom, it's the worship of self again. I want and I don't have. I'm coveting in my heart. I like what that guy has. I don't trust God to provide it for me in his time. I I don't wait on him. I won't work for it. I love myself and I don't love others. I'm willing to rob and impoverish others to enrich myself. Who is the God? The God is me. The altar is my unsatiated desires. And the act of sacrifice is a lack of love for God and a lack of love for others. I don't care who it costs. And at the bottom, this theft, greed, covetousness, which is idolatry, is a form of cosmic treason. It is a way of saying, God, you're running the universe, I see you on your throne, and I don't like the way it's going. You're you're not operating the universe right, I need to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to be king, I'm going to sit on that throne, I'm going to run things here, and I'm going to get what I want. And at this level, the idolatry would have me at the top of everything. I don't care who it hurts. You will be like God. Whether you're fudging on your taxes, pocketing breath mints at the grocery store, or misappropriating resources at work, all of this falls under the banner of idolatry. Because it is willing to disobey God to serve self. It is willing to fail at love for others in order to worship me. Do you have the category for thinking of sins in your own heart and life in these terms? Have you ever gone through this exercise of of boiling down any sin in a given day to where's the idolatry, where's the unbelief? What am I worshiping rather than God when I'm tempted to fill in the blank? What am I worshiping rather than God when I fail to do positively what God has commanded? And what am I not believing about the greatness of God, the goodness of God, or the warnings from God? I hope this is a regular exercise for you to to not just say, oh, I blew it again, God, sorry. But actually to unearth the idolatries and the unbelief in which those sins grow. How do I know something has become an idol? Others have said this well. If I'm willing to sin to get something, it's already at the level of idolatry. If I'm willing to sin because I couldn't get it, it also rises to the level of idolatry. So just fill in the blank. Complaining, bitterness, resentment towards God. I didn't like how that went. Okay, I loved it too much. I didn't trust Him. He's good. 
I didn't believe it. Listen, it is idolatry if you want one of God's good gifts, but not God. If I have to go through God to get a good gift, something that God calls good. I have to go around God to get something that I want. I have raised the good gift above the giver. It's idolatry. The fourth thing you need to know about idolatry this morning is that idolatry provokes the Lord to jealousy. Revelation 6 through 19 is the story of the future of earth. And it is the future history of God's provocation. God has been so patient. But in the end, His goodness will burst forth in holy judgment, in jealousy for the hearts of His creatures. Humanity humanity has persisted in worshiping the works of their hands. God will bring it all to judgment. Just as a side note, jealousy in God is a good thing. Uh, We hear the word jealousy and we think, oh, that person's so jealous. Jealousy is always sin. No, jealousy is not always sin. A husband jealous for his wife's affections is a good husband. (laughs) It's appropriate. God, the creator of all things, jealous for the affections of his creatures, is good and right and beautiful. It's excellent. By the way, it's not only good for God, for him to receive all glory that he's due, it's also good for us to actually live up to our purpose. You try to live for another purpose, you will always be frustrated. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Back to this section we need to cover together as a church someday. Verse 21. Listen to the parallel between a reference to the Lord's table and the table of demons with the word fellowship, partnering, a sharing together. Verse 21, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Do you understand what's at stake here? When we worship things rather than God, either by misconceiving God, worshiping demons, or worshiping created things, all of it boiling down to the worship of self, we provoke His jealousy. The worship is due to God alone. There's no middle ground. You can't play for both teams. The Great Tribulation, Revelation 6-19, through are God's judgments against the world of humans who bear His image but give Him no glory. They trespass His earth and they don't give thanks. They breathe His air. They receive His good gifts and they complain. They are ungrateful, unloving, unholy. And like the ungrateful, spoiled child slapping his mom in the face, the human race has pursued its idolatrous bent for six millennia. And God has been so patient. God has rescued many from it. But God will not forever endure the slight the offense, the libel on his character, and the perpetual malignancy of his creatures. God knows it is not good for the human race to keep propagating itself with a natural bent toward worshiping lesser things. It's not good for us to be idolaters. God will judge. That is what the day of the Lord is all about. God will be vindicated as the one true God, and he will broke no rivals. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 40. I know we're zipping back and forth a little bit here this morning. Look at verse 21 of Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is He who inhabits above the circle of the earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Look down at verse 25. To whom then will you liken me that I would be His equal, says the Holy One? 
Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his vigor and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Listen, this whole section, the nine chapters of Isaiah 40 to 48, are this great rhetorical question, to whom will you compare to Yahweh? Does he, does he have anybody that's a contestant in, in the great open challenge? Is there anyone like him? And the answer to that, of course, is no. There, there is none like him. And, and Isaiah, bold prophet that he is, challenges his audience, test drive anybody, test drive any god, test drive any rival. Is there any comparison to Yahweh in his greatness and his goodness? That leads us to the last thing we need to know about idolatry. Nothing compares to the one true God. Nothing compares to the one true God. And that contrast is implicit in this chapter in Revelation 9. It's implicit in this way. God is the one sovereignly orchestrating the events down to the precise moment He has decreed. Do you remember the, the four demonic beings who are bound at the Euphrates River and they are released and they bring out the hordes of demons, the lion-fanged horse creatures who decimate the human population. And they are released at the precise year and day and hour and moment. And they are given power to inflict torment. In other words, God's the one orchestrating all these things. God is in charge. And yet the earth dwellers will not repent of their worship of idols. Don't you know God's in charge? The contrast is stunning. These idols can't rescue you from the wrath of God. Keep bowing down to them. They are no help. They're nothings. And they're actually against you. The idols cannot protect the earth dwellers from God's wrath. It's reminiscent of 1 Samuel 5. You remember when the, the Philistines came and they took the Ark of the Covenant uh, where God manifestly dwelt and they took it off to Ashdod and they put it before uh, their own idol called Dagon. And what happened the next morning? They come out and Dagon had fallen over on his face. Of course, he's just a carved rock. He's not a anything. And they put him back up and he fell down again and his head broke off and his arms broke off. Listen, all of the idolatries of the world will fall on their faces when God is revealed. And yet the unrepentant will not turn from them. The contrast is explicit for us in Revelation 10. Look down at verse 6. There's an angel there who swears by God who lives forever and ever. How is God described here? Who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and all the things in it, and the sea and all the things in it. What is the contrast? Worthless idols that are nothing and represent demonic forces and the love of self, over and against the living God who made everything. The contrast is dramatic. Luke 21, 10, 21, God is called the Lord of heaven and earth. In Deuteronomy 4.28, idols are called gods, the works of man's hands, wood and stone, they can't see or hear, or eat or smell. Deuteronomy 4.39, by contrast, Yahweh is God in heaven above and on the earth below, there is no other. And the contrast is between that which is dead, blind, deaf and dumb versus the living God. I want us to pause and think carefully for a few moments about another significant contrast. What is the difference between idolatry and surrendering your life to the one true God? I'll put it very simply. Idolatry is bad, while God is good. And this contrast is significant. God is good, and God does good. He is goodness. He is the definition of what is good. He's the source of what is good. Everything he does flows out of his intrinsic goodness. Idolatry is bad. An idol 
the phony version of God it represents, or the demon behind the idol, or the sinful human nature promoting adoration of self, they are all bad. Meaning, they're malicious, harmful, not helpful. Taste and see that Yahweh is good. Listen, humans, you have tasted and seen already that idolatry is bad. Devoting your life to lesser things than God, it it never works out. It produces no benefit. It, It only produces bad results. It ends in fruitlessness, rottenness, decay, degradation, destruction. All the while provoking the holy justice of God. The pagan deities promised seasonal rains, good harvests, and fertility. What did they require? Heartless devotion, empty ceremonies, time, money, child sacrifice. And those non-gods couldn't control the weather. They made empty promises. It was a trick. You burned your child in the fires of Molech for what? Nothing but slavery to a fiendish demon who only lusted after your destruction. Furthermore, the worship of these deities perverted the good gifts of God like food and drink and sexuality. Pagan idolatry promised life and happiness and prosperity and fulfillment, but it stole everything from from its adherence, adherence out the back door. It's like those emails you get from Zimbabwe. There's $186,000 waiting for you in a bank account, but I need you to wire me $1,200 to get it out. Of course, there's not $186,000 waiting for you in Zimbabwe, and you will never see your $1,200 again. It's a swindle. Idolatry is a bad deal. You make sacrifices to the idol, you give up what's truly valuable in exchange for what? Fleeting pleasure? Cheap toys? In our modern, sophisticated idolatries, the swindle is the same. Promises are made with no ability ever to keep them. Listen, you and I hate false advertising. No one likes to be duped. No one likes to be swindled and tricked. I fell for an eBay scam one time. It was too good to be true. KitchenAid stand mixer at half the price. I sent the money, and the stand mixer never showed up. It was a bad deal. It was an empty promise. It was a scam. You might be saying, I I don't bow to any God. I'm the commander of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. This is, of course, the most insane version of idolatry. You're not looking any farther than the four corners of your own puny heart for satisfaction. The tottering statue is you. The one making empty promises and vain boasts is you. And just a reminder, you're a creature, finite, limited, puny. You get frustrated at your own circumstances because you can't control them. You complain about the weather because you're not in charge of it. You bemoan aging because you're vulnerable and mortal. You curse governments because they interfere with your self-interest. You are a puny God. And when sinful humans look to themselves for satisfaction, ultimate meaning, and fulfillment, they have exalted themselves in all of their puniness to the place only God has the right and the power. You were designed for the adoration and enjoyment of God. That's a big role to fill. And you're not big enough to fill it. God is an ocean He is all the world's oceans. He is universes full of worlds of oceans. And your capacity to fulfill the design of human existence is like a toddler's sippy cup. Your puny, finite capacity can never compare to God's capacity to provide joy, satisfaction, and pleasure. Idolatry is the greatest swindle of them all. Idolatry appeals to our natural yearnings for love, belonging, fulfillment, happiness, prosperity, health, comfort, and pleasure. Listen, you were actually built to enjoy these things. You were made for them in the enjoyment of God. 
God won't short on his promise. He says, in my right hand are pleasures forevermore. He means it. He'll fulfill it. You will never find fulfillment in God's gifts without a right relationship to the giver. So here again is the contrast. Idols are bad. God is good. The idol wants you a slave of misery until you're dead. Idolatry gives just enough of a tease of what you're looking for to keep you on the hook. The idol is a liar and a murderer. Idolatry is a mortal swindle with eternal consequences. God is the maker and giver of all good things. God invented fun. And he he designed you with the capacity to have it. Belonging to God is like having the owner of the toy factory as your dad. But if you reject the giver, you actually can't get the gifts. There are two sides in this cosmic battle. They couldn't be more different. Idolatry makes unkeepable promises, and the promise-keeping God gives to the undeserving out of His infinite generosity. An idol does not love you. And the God of heaven is love. Listen, is there a cost to following Christ? Do do we have to give up things to follow Jesus? The answer to that is yes. Listen to Luke 9. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. To follow Christ, you must actually be willing to give up anything and everything that competes for first place. But in our losing things to follow Christ... We find that God gives and gives and gives and gives. It's actually gain. The things we lose for Christ turn out to be valueless, and the things we gain are infinite. Listen to Paul in Philippians 3. Whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ, and that I may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith, so that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead." David Livingstone was an explorer and a missionary in Africa, trekking new ground, discovering new things, and taking the gospel where it had not yet been known. In a lecture that he gave in England to college students, he said, I never made a sacrifice. Going without all of the comforts of Western civilization, enduring all of the hardships he endured for the sake of the gospel, he said, in the service of Christ, I never sacrificed. What does he mean by that? The things I lost? Valueless. What I gain in Christ now and in eternity? Worth every bit of it. You and I were built for adoration. And when we turn our affections to finite things, made things, puny things, we lose out on having our hearts warmed by that which is too big for us and will never leave us unsatisfied. Listen, turning to Christ is a matter of turning from idolatry. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, Paul describes those who believed in Jesus as those who turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Turning from idolatry is also a matter of growth in the Christian life. You should go home this afternoon and read all of Colossians 3, 1 to 10. I intended to read it all. We're out of time. Read that when you get home. I'll close with 1 John 5, 21. 
The same man who recorded this vision in Revelation 9 said this in a letter. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. Heavenly Father, we know it is our natural tendency to look away from you and to worship anything besides you. Forgive us this bent. Oh God, bring our hearts back to you every morning to worship the living God, to come to grips with the awful reality of our idolatries. We, we feel them in our hearts. We feel the residue of them. We feel the pull of them internally. We recognize the pressure of the world around us in its culture, overwhelmed by idolatries. And yet we have come to know you, the true and living God. God, would you keep us close at the heart level to root out unbelief, to root out idolatries, and to love you as you deserve. Of course, we long for the day when you are vindicated, not just in the world, but in our own hearts. That day when we will be with you, we will see you, we will be like you as far as it's possible for finite beings to resemble the infinite goodness of God. And we will never worship idols again. In Jesus' name, amen.